As we think about how life unfolds, are we living a script? Are we living something that's been laid out from the very beginning of creation such that from the beginning of everything that ever is, it was destined and fated that I would be giving this sermon at this moment wearing these brown socks? Is that this determined from all eternity? Or is, is if, do I have a choice? Do we have choice in the matter? I could have chosen to wear different socks, right? And, uh, that, but that there is this one plan that God has laid out, and that if I don't follow this plan, that I have derailed myself, and I will thus be, go, go down a spiral of futility, or go in the wrong direction and, and doom myself, get derailed, and never be able to get back on track. Right? And if this is the case, if there is a plan that, for, that I'm, I need to follow, that God has laid out for us, and we do have free will, wouldn't it be nice to know what that plan is? Why don't we get, uh, you know, in Harry Potter, the beginning of Harry Potter, the, the owl show up and drop off invitations? Wouldn't it be nice to get a little owl to drop off an invitation so that you would know what you needed to do next in life? Or, or the, the standard request, right? Uh, Skywriting, the take the job. Oh, good, I should take the job. It's nice, clear. Of course, of course, that would get confusing with everyone wondering. You'd have to, it'd have to be more direct. Andy, take the job so that no one got confused. But these questions about what is, how does God lay out uh, the future? How does God lay out paths and plans for people? How do we know what God's will is for my life? What should I do with the rest of my life? These are the type of questions we'll take a swing at today. Um, I will give a caveat that I'm going to give you one way to, to think through this. I happen to believe it, and I think it's right. There are other people, other churches, other traditions that would disagree with me, and that's okay. And you may disagree with me, and, and, and that's okay too. Well, I, I think the best way to start grappling with such big questions is not with some sort of abstract theory, but by looking at people, people in Scripture, looking at how lives unfold, looking at how God was involved in people in the past. For example, with Moses, I am fairly certain that it was not in God's plan that Moses would get up one day and go kill an Egyptian guard. I don't think that was God's plan. I don't think uh, God wanted that to happen so that then Moses would be exiled and then learn the ways of the wilderness and be prepared to lead the Hebrew people out of slavery. I think that was God making the best of, of Moses' really stupid idea. Anytime you get up in the morning and you think God wants me to kill someone, you might want to check, because I don't think that's ever exactly what God's thinking. So I, I, what we see here is uh, God continuing to walk with Moses, even when Moses does something really, really bad. Uh, David is the same type of situation. I, have, I am certain that uh, David did not des uh, God did not desire for David to rape Bathsheba. Uh, that's, that's just a given, right? We, this, the whole passage, that whole story is just full of, of uh, detail and context and euphemism that if you pay attention, it puts David in a pretty bad light. It starts by telling us, uh, in the spring, when kings lead their armies out to war to defend their nation, where is David? He's at home. And what's he doing at home? He tells us that while he is lounging on his couch on the roof of the palace, he has his army out in the field, which is a pretty scuzz-tacular way to, to lead an army from your couch. And, and then who does he send out the army under the direction of? He sends it out under the direction of Joab. And if you look up Joab in Scripture, he's a, he, he's, he's a piece of work. I, if I describe him, you'll start thinking that you shouldn't use those words in the pulpit, and you might be right. The point being, you don't send out your army under the control of Joab. So David has really whiffed uh, on this one. And so he is uh, lounging on his couch as he sees a woman, he rapes her, and uh, that's not God's plan for his, his life. The, not, that's not God's hope for his life. But what happens afterwards is that uh, God doesn't ditch David because he's messed up, and indeed, God continues to invite David to be faithful. And it ends up being a son of David and Bathsheba, who ends up being the next king, King Solomon. Right? What we see in these stories of Scripture, as well as in other points of Scripture, remember Paul, before he's the great church planner, he is the great church persecutor, but we see in, in these stories of, of these key figures of Scripture, what I believe we're seeing there is God's desire to collaborate with us, that God has a broad outline, a general sense of what could be next, what might be next. 
And that, that relationship between God and any particular human is a partnership where God is suggesting things like peace, confession, forgiveness, repentance, service, humility, and then we make the decision whether to do as such or, or, or not. We choose whether to partner with God or to do our own thing. God could have a remote control to force us to do what he desires, but God chooses not to. God never forces anyone and instead waits for our decisions. We are made in the image of God, and that means our decisions have weight. They matter. That's the our Father in Heaven part of, of God, that God is a parent, right? How often as a parent are you tempted to find a remote control, point at your, your child and say, Eat your dinner! Click! Wouldn't that be nice? It, 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 you know it wouldn't be healthy. You know it wouldn't be for their good. But it's tempting. And I'm sure God is tempted to do as such as well. But uh, a child has to make more and more of his or her own decisions over time. And we are the same. And so like any parent, God has a general plan. In the same way that I have a general plan for the future of my children. Well, I have desires, I have hopes, I have dreams for them. But in the end, they're going to do what they're going to do. And uh, I'm going to raise them, they're going to be just right. right. You get to laugh at me over the next couple of years as we see how that unfolds. But uh, <laughs> what we have here is God seeking to be our collaborators. To work with us, to, to inv invite us to certain habits and patterns and way of life. And then we choose whether to accept this. What I find the best way to, to get my mind around this is to think of our lives as books. And every book is broken down into chapters, right? So if you think of your life, if you were going to write your autobiography this week and you got out a blank sheet of paper, what would be the chapters? Start, start thinking through your life. From the very beginning, what, if, you, if you had to write a, a chapter about your childhood, what would you call it? What would be the main themes? What would be the important things you'd, you'd need to share? Right? For me, it was a move from one part uh, of Illinois to another that was just essential for, in my childhood. For a friend of mine, it was a divorce that happened, the, it, well, his parents' divorce. I mean, what are the big events of your childhood? And then you go on from there, and, and what's the chapter on your teenage years? What's that involved? And, and the chapter of, of the early adulthood, you, you, college, job, marriage, family. Uh, when do family members start getting sick, the generation above you? What, how did that impact? Midlife crisis? Crisis, empty nest, grandchildren, retirement, all of these pieces. If you were going to lay out your life as a book, what would each part of your life, what would that chapter look like? Okay. And as you think about your life like that, what were the good chapters? What were the chapters that bring you joy and contentment and peace? What would be the stories, the chapters that you would want to share and could do so with pride? And what were the bad ones? What were the chapters of your life that you would rather not revisit, don't particularly want to talk about, and would rather prefer no one ask you a question regarding? Right? If you think about those bad chapters, what made them so bad? What made them so hard? In my experience, the worst parts of my life are those moments, those times when I'm writing my own story instead of accepting God's invitation to collaborate and work with God. Right? Just like Moses doing his own thing when he kills uh, the Egyptian, just like David raping Bathsheba. If you're a self-made man, if you're a self-made woman, then you're focused on yourself and you end up with self-made problems. Right? So what the what happens to those bad chapters? They end. And how, how do they end? They end for Moses when he turns around and accepts working at God's invitation when David confesses. And I think that's the tr true of our lives as well. Our lives turn around and the best parts of our lives occur when we are accepting God's invitation to seek justice and mercy, to practice forgiveness, to be merciful, graceful as a way of life. Our lives work best when God is helping to write our story, selecting the plot to the book that is our life. God as co-author who guides and advises. When we walk away from God's advice, then we also know that God is always there inviting us to turn the page, start a new chapter, and, and see what happens next. This way of thinking about our lives and God's role, it does raise some interesting questions. You might wonder, what would happen had Moses not killed the Egyptian guard? Would he still have ended up leading the slaves to freedom? Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe someone else would have done it. Maybe that, I don't know, maybe he would still ended up leading the slaves but not spent the time in the wilderness. I don't know. What if David had uh, kept his pants on? Always a good idea to keep your pants on. But what if David had kept his pants on, right? 
what uh, the, the nation of Israel held together for another generation because David introduced so much strife into the, the royal family that then the nation split. Would Israel's history have unfolded differently? I, I don't know. These are interesting questions. They, there are big questions we can probably guess the answers to. If, if, if Jesus had entered Jerusalem in his third Passover, and for some reasons the Sadducees had not been angry enough to foment for his crucifixion that time, it would have happened the fourth time, right? The fourth time he went to Passover. Moses was going to free the slaves. The crucifixion was going to happen. God has broad outlines and plans that will occur. Just the details we're not quite sure on, right? This leaves us with intriguing questions. If, if God desires to be the co-author of the chapters of our lives, how do we know what to do next? How do we know what to do next? There are times that people have received direct messages. Moses does get a burning bush. And wouldn't that be nice to walk outside and have your own personal burning bush? Just to have your, your spouse be able to say, Hey, the bush outside is burning. God wants to tell you something. That would be great. I would love that. I'm not holding my breath, right? Uh, there are uh, people in, in, uh, in the Bible, who are prophets who receive visions and dreams, and, and that's wonderful, and that's great, and I'm sure it can, do, can happen, still happens, does happen, but that's not my experience. And, and as I think about, uh, we have the stories of maybe 40, 50, 60 people in the Bible, just rough guess. If, think of the entire nation of Israel, and we have 40, 50, 60 people stories. Think of all the rest of all those other people who are just living their lives. How did they know what, how, what to do, how to follow God? I think that's where we are. I mean, if one of you has a vision, that is great. Tell me about it. I can't wait to hear. Until that time, how do we discern God's plan today? I think we begin a few ways. We begin with the prayers of the church, as we talked about last time. Uh, the prayers of the church, we join with uh, the prayers of, of people around the world and paying attention to what the rest of the church is praying for. I also think we read scripture, and we read scripture with an eye towards what is God passionate about? Is that what I'm passionate about? Do you know what Jesus is passionate about in the Gospels? Have you ever paid attention to that? What really gets Jesus riled up? I can tell you. I can also tell you how to cook a really good steak. I can tell you about how to cook a really good steak all day long. But you know what's better than me telling you about a steak? Is you eating it. Right? I can tell you what Jesus is passionate about all day long. What's a lot better is you opening up and reading some Gospels. And just taking, taking some notes. Get a blank piece of paper and say, what does Jesus care about? And just start taking some notes. And then ask yourself, am I doing anything about that? Am I doing what Jesus is passionate about? Am I passionate about what Jesus is passionate about? All right, get other people together to, to help figure out what, what, what you... Th what, if you have an idea about what God might desire you to do, ask some people you trust. All right? It is easy to be deluded by yourself. How many, of you have, how many times in your life have you had a great idea that once you ask someone turns out to be a horrible idea? I had a great idea once. I was, I, I was working as a chaplain, and I was paying for the privilege to work full-time at the Duke University Medical Center, but I was getting college credit, whatever. The point being, I thought, I could keep on doing this for a year, and they'd pay me. And I, I brought this idea to the rest of the other chaplains, and they all looked at me and said, Andy, that's a horrible idea. You will burn out, and you will f crash and burn. You'll, no, that's a horrible idea. And they were right. right? I, had, I had a great idea, and I was wrong. <laughs> Yep, I was wrong. Um, and also, got to be willing to take a risk. God calls us to be faithful, not to be comfortable. Think about the most important things you've done in your life, the most important chapters. Were they comfortable? Right? The important things we do, the godly things that we do, the things we do because God calls us to them, are rarely comfortable. Usually important, rarely comfortable. And finally, we pay attention to what brings us satisfaction. Again, not comfort, but satisfaction. God desires us to be faithful, to be at peace. <clears throat> now, thinking of these ideas that we try to discern God's will for us through prayer and scripture, gathering with others, taking a risk, seeing what happens, um, some of you might be thinking, you know, I'm not a spring chicken. That might be true. However, is anyone here dead? Poke your neighbor, make sure everyone's alive. Seriously, poke your neighbor. Everyone responding to some degree. What that means is you got at least another chapter left. You have 
at least another chapter left. Abraham wasn't a dad until he was in his 90s. Can you imagine that, being a new dad in your 90s? Whew. If you're not dead, you have another page in front of you. A new chapter can begin today, and there's no way that you can stray so far from God that you can't turn back and begin again. My friends, I reject the idea that God has a plan that we're going to follow no matter what. I reject the idea that God has a plan that if we get derailed from, that we will never be able to get back on board. I do not believe that God controls us. My belief, my understanding based upon years of reading scripture, my own life experience, attending to the, what the saints say, just listening and following Jesus. What I believe is that God seeks to collaborate with each and every one of us. God wants to be a co-author of this marvelous work of art called our lives. The most important thing you will ever do is live your life. And God is completely willing to help you live it and live it well. Amen.